Well, um, I'll shift to English. Um, you know, there's so much I can tell you about Esther that I could talk the whole hour, but don't worry. Um, another alternative is to use Esther's method, which is to talk very, very fast. But I already warned her about that. Not all of us are native speakers of English, so that too is off the table. Uh, instead, I'll just mention a selected few of her many accolades and talk a bit about her fascinating research and then give her the floor. So Esther received her PhD in sociology in 2003 from uh, Princeton University, where she was a, a Wilson scholar. She's a fellow at Harvard's Berkman Center uh, for Internet and Society. She was a fellow at Stanford's Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. And mainly, uh, she's a professor, a Delaney family professor in the Communication Studies Department at Northwestern University, which is where I got to know her uh, and her incredible colleagues uh, during my postdoc. Her work was supported by the U.S. National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, Nokia, Google, and many others. And she received awards from the American Sociological Association, the Eastern Sociological Society, the International Communication Association, which gave Esther in 2010 its Outstanding Young Scholar Award, uh, also an awards from the National Communication Association and the Telecommunications Policy Research Conference. So if you look at these awards, they, it, we have the Sociological Association, Communication Association, Policy Research Conference, they map Esther's work at the intersection of sociology, communication, and policy. Esther is one of a small number of researchers who have been saying for many years what Tom, uh, Tom Reeves mentioned yesterday, that classifying people into groups based on their generation and assuming that the young generation, the net generation, simply picked up uh, valuable online skills as they interacted, spent hours and hours a day with their computers or smartphones, is far too simplistic. Unlike many others who published articles, book chapters, and whole books full of anecdotes about online skills of youngsters, Esther chose the more difficult route and actually collected data about real people in the real world, showing that the acquisition of valuable skills, as well as the ability to apply these skills to acquire capital, social capital, financial capital, they depend on the same variables that influence our chances of successfully coping with other challenges uh, of society. Socioeconomic uh, variables, race, gender, etc. If we want a society that, that, if we want as a society to harness digital technologies to positively influence social change, we need a nuanced understanding of these processes. Without, without insights such as those Esther will present today, we will witness how digital technologies actually increase the gaps <clears throat> between the haves and the have-nots in society in general and in the educational system in particular. So during Esther's talk, I suggest you pay close attention to two main themes, methodology and policy. Esther pays special attention to the unique methodological challenges of researching online behavior. In 2009, she published an intriguing book titled Research Confidential, Solutions to Problems Most Social Scientists Pretend They Never Have. I think the title says it all, uh, and have a look at it. Methodology is very important, and when you're involved in interdisciplinary research in an emerging field, methodological issues are a constant source of both opportunity as well as challenge. Policy is another important issue for a social scientist who believes it is important policy should be guided not only by anecdote, but also by evidence. I hope we'll find time to go deeper behind the scenes of methodology as well as touch on policy in the meeting right after this lecture upstairs at the Kanbal Hall. Uh, it is open to students as well as to everyone else. I uh, will give priority to students, but, uh, but again, everyone is invited for this more intimate talk. So Esther, it's an honor and a pleasure to invite you to give your talk titled Differentiated Internet Skills, Sources, and Implications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerome, for the kind introduction. And um, thanks to everyone for coming. And thanks also to Yoram Ashad. Both Yorams have been incredibly uh, gracious in hosting me 
uh, in the past few days. Um, I've, I've truly very much enjoyed my time in Israel so far. Um, so Yoram kind of gave away some of my conclusions, but hopefully I can still hold on to your attention throughout this talk. Um, I will start by telling you a little bit about the general questions that motivate my research. Mm, it might be a little too bright. Okay. Uh, and then talk in detail about a study that's, well, it's multiple studies. It's one big study, lots of findings. And then I look forward to the detailed conversation later. So before I start, Yoram did mention that I'm a sociologist. And since I know that people here are from very different fields, I thought I would put myself on a spectrum of fields just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I'll give you a minute to read this, but you should laugh because it's kind of funny. Um, I, I didn't come up with this. It's the very insightful XKCD comic that I highly recommend. It's very geeky, but very insightful. Uh, anyway, so as you can see, sociology, um, and I embrace this, is the, what we think of as a discipline where uh, we like to complicate things because we recognize that the world is very complicated. So I'm not here to tell you some really pretty bottled response in one sentence, what I'm here to tell you is that things are in fact complicated. And if we're looking for a solution that's kind of a one sentence sound bite, then that's not what you're going to get from me. So there's been a lot of enthusiasm about the internet, how it was basically going to solve all our problems. Um, and it's actually quite fascinating that to this day, uh, there are people who talk about the internet or digital media in this way. Um, but interestingly, or not shockingly, to those of us who study the history of technologies, we get the exact opposite as well. And um, I don't know how it is here, but certainly in the US, it's almost daily phenomenon that some people will comment on how the internet is in fact destroying our society. So which is it? Uh, the short uh, answer to that is, of course, it depends. It depends on the uh, particular context and situation and people involved. So. It's not realistic to, to look for that one outcome. It really depends on the particular context. OK, so overall, the, the big question that drives my research, as a sociologist, I'm interested in questions of social inequality. I'm interested in figuring out who are the people who are benefiting from digital media, who might not be benefiting. How do we make sure that most people, in fact, benefit and that we're not ending up, we're not ending up in a situation worse than when, when we started? Uh, in terms of sociological theories, this uh, concerns social mobility or versus social reproduction. So if you're at, from the perspective of someone from a lower socioeconomic status, are you, thanks to digital media, are you going to be able to uh, improve your situation or will you be stuck where you were in the beginning or even worse, potentially uh, lose even more ground? So the possible outcomes from these options would be, let's say we have people who are lower socioeconomic status and higher socioeconomic status, and they benefit equally from their time using digital media, and the outcome then would be pretty much the same as we have today, which is that there's a difference between these groups. Okay. Um, another possibility is that, in fact, those who are from less privileged backgrounds are able to gain things from the digital media uses that allow them to catch up with those who are in more privileged positions. So that would be an optimistic view, assuming that we agree that having more equality in society is a desirable outcome. But another possibility is that, in fact, those who are in less privileged positions are not gaining as quickly as those who are in more privileged positions. And so, in fact, the differences between groups will increase over time meaning that we end up with a situation that's actually worse than what we started with. One thing you might have noticed is that overall there is a bit of optimism in all of these graphs in that all of the, uh, all of the lines go upward. Um, and so this is sort of the most optimistic view of any of these scenarios. And in fact, you could have the lines going downward. And so that remains a question. I want to just spend a moment on the overall framework that uh, motivates my work. So, I start out with internet users. 15 years ago, I was also interested in non-users, but as more and more people became users, I, focused, I started shifting my focus on differences among users. So mo moving away from the rhetoric of the digital divide and recognizing that even among users, we will see differences. And as a sociologist, it's very important for me to recognize people's so, so, uh, societal backgrounds and um, where they are in society. 
but also contexts both technological and social that might influence how people use uh, digital media. And then what I've argued is that all of these feed into people's internet skills or what others in this room have referred to uh, as digital literacy. And then the uh, big question is, how might all these factors, including skill, influence what people do online, both in terms of information seeking as well as the more contributory uh, engagement types of activities? And then the really big question, which is the implications part of the title, is how do all these different factors then feed into people's life chances in different domains, whether that has to do with academic achievement, which is something that I'm sure many people in this audience are interested in, but also lots of other types of life outcomes. So how might your internet uses influence all of these different types of outcomes? So I, uh, I have a slide on what I think about, how I think about skill, but I want to recognize that this is just one of several ways of thinking about skill. Uh, so certainly, Yoram Eshed has done uh, really great work in this domain, more under the term digital literacy, where he has some other uh, factors that he classifies. Uh, particularly missing from here is the socio-emotional skill that um, I think is important. I just, it's not quite what I focused on, but I think is important to explore in the future. Today I'll talk about different components of this, less about the information seeking and credibility assessment work, although I've done a lot in that domain as well and have many publications. Um, so overall the skills I'm asking and looking at today are, uh, do we see skill differences among users? Um, how widespread is participation? Um, when it comes to joining communities and also actually putting your content out there, how is this linked to skill, and then so what? Why should we care? Okay, so one thing that's interesting uh, across generations, and this is more anecdotal, but uh, I think um, I'm sure we've all heard these anecdotes, is that everybody thinks that young uh, people are just really savvy with technology. You're already quoted this in the intro. And so basically, there are these assumed characteristics of quote unquote digital natives, um, which people disagree where they draw that line, but basically people who've grown up with technology all their lives. Um, so the question though is, empirically speaking, as opposed to just observing your niece, um, do we see that these are actually generalizable um, characteristics of this generation? And so giving away some of my conclusions up front, so generally what the literature has found that yes, um, in fact, people who've grown up with technologies have truly used them throughout their lives. Um, to some extent, it's true that they spend a lot of time with digital media, but it's not quite as generalizable. It's not necessarily true at all that they're engaging in multitudes of activities and doing all sorts of things. And finally, um, it is definitely not the case that they're all universally savvy. And so these are the, the empirical questions I'll be exploring, especially the, the end part. So there are different uh, methods that we can use to study internet skill. It's not a straightforward uh, approach. Um, you can't just ask people how skilled they are. I mean, people have done that, but it turns out from more in-depth research that that's not a very good, not very reliable measure of how skilled they actually are. Um, one way to do research on this is in-person observations, which I've done uh, in those years indicated on the slides. I will not really be talking about that work today, but happy to address questions later in the session following this one. Um, and I've, I've done a lot of survey research, some of it drawing on the observational work uh, to collect data about skill and other types of uh, online uh, backgrounds and experiences. Okay, so I want to uh, spend a few slides telling you about the methods of my work. I think you need to know where my data are coming from for you to believe or at least try to believe uh, or give a chance to what I'm telling you. Um, I don't think I should take for granted uh, that you will believe what I'm telling you. Um, so uh, I do a lot of research uh, at this university in the um, sort of central part of Chicago and I'll show you a map in a little bit because I don't assume that you guys are familiar with sh Chicago geography. But I decided to focus on young adults because of all these assumptions about how young adults are super savvy. So I wanted to see, well, how true is that in fact? Um, so there's this university, University of Illinois Chicago. I myself am not affiliated with this university. I've never worked there, I've never studied there. Um, so in the United States, this is where Chicago is located. And this is part of Chicago and the suburbs. So Northwestern is where I work and UIC is down there. 
Um, that's about, oh, I don't know, 30 kilometers difference. And there are all sorts of universities in between the two, so why did I choose UIC? It's certainly not convenient. We collected a lot of the data in winter in person. Uh, those were the average temperature in 2009, um, so not particularly convenient. Um, however, UIC, it turns out, is one of the most diverse, ethnically diverse universities in the country, which is interesting if you're a sociologist like me interested in social disparities. So that was a uh, great population for me to work with. Also, many of them are first-generation college students. So even though they're all in college, and in that sense, they're already more educated than the average American, they are, in fact, uh, still quite diverse. The other advantage of working with this population is that they actually have a course that they require of everybody to take. Uh, that makes it sound easier than it is. It's actually a course taught in 90 different sections, so it's not like I could just walk into one classroom. But that was helpful. Um, conducted a paper pencil survey. So as Joram mentioned, uh, one of the things I hope you will think about uh, as I present this work is methodology and methods to study digital media uses. And you might be wondering why use paper and pencil? It's really outdated, it's really tedious, it's a lot of work. Why don't you just have people punch stuff into the computer? That way you don't have to code the data, et cetera, um, or enter the data. Well, the, the reality is that if you're interested in internet skills and people's access to the internet, you can't really ask them online because you, by automatically you'd be selecting out the people, uh, you'd be biasing towards those who do spend more time online and have more privacy online. So gathered data in 2009, um, followed up a year later with the same people. Uh, at this point, I did it in postal mail, so yes, again, archaic and very tedious and then followed up yet one more time in postal mail uh, three years later with a pretty good response rate for longitudinal studies. And mainly I'll be drawing on the data from 2012, so you don't have to worry that I'm showing you really outdated data. But I will purposefully draw on some of the 2009 data because it is in fact very rare for us to have data about the same people over time and to be able to track any differences that might happen to people over time when it comes to their internet uses. Okay, so first, how reliable can my data be? Um, obviously, we know there are problems with surveys, so another methodological point, any of you who collect survey research, I highly uh, who do survey research, I highly recommend a question like this on your survey. Uh, this basically makes sure that people are actually paying attention to the, your survey, and what we do is we throw out all the cases that don't answer this correctly, which uh, that first year was, uh, 4% of the people, um, and then in 2012 I actually had two such questions for even higher quality, um, and we had to throw out 3.5% of the surveys. So not too bad, um, but I'm quite confident in the quality of the data because of these verification questions on the, on the instrument. So these are the people in terms of their 2009 background. Um, as I mentioned, many of them are first generation college students. Uh, in the U.S. of interest are race and ethnicity questions. I've read several articles um, done on Israeli populations, and I know you have different types of uh, more religious and ethnic categories that you use here for looking at differences and sort of map this onto that. It's a similar idea. Um, but of course, it's important to recognize that this is a very particular segment of the American population. Um, why should you care? You're here in Israel. Uh, I would say that from the research I do know about Israeli uh, samples and also other countries, so these findings do in fact um, show up elsewhere. So some of the categories might be different, but there are definitely systematic differences across population segments. So uh, the point is for you to, it's not so much the exact percentages I will tell you, show you that are of interest, but the patterns across different population groups that I want you to think about. Okay, so is it the wired generation? Yes, so those assumptions are correct. Indeed, these people grow up with digital media in their everyday lives and they use these media a lot. And in fact, they still check email a lot, which is there have been some questions of whether today's young adults really use email. And anecdotally, beyond these figures, I can also say anecdotally, we pay people uh, in 2010 and 2012, we paid them after they took the survey. And, we would email them to ask them what kind of gift card they wanted, and they emailed us back very quickly. So they definitely check email when it's in their interest. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, one of the important factors of studying or measuring skill is people's 
awareness and understanding of what's even available online, right? So if you don't know that something is possible, then you're unlikely to engage in it. And so the instrument that I developed over 10 years ago at this point that came out of my dissertation work, I collected data on actual skill, lots of in-depth data observational work, and then I, I checked to see what survey measures correlated best with those actual skill measures and have used that in my surveys. Unfortunately, this has been adopted by some other people as well. So part of the point here is just to show you that there is in fact a range of knowledge even among young adults and some things are very, are understood at a very relatively low level. Um, and you might be thinking, well, BCC, well, you know, do we really care if people know that it's blind carbon copy? And no, that's not the point. And in fact, in 2010, I followed up with a multiple choice question to see, well, on a multiple choice question, can people say what this is? And I'll give you a minute to read the options. And I think if you know what BCC is, it's not too hard to guess from these options. This isn't trying to be tricky. Um, but interestingly, a third of the people, a third of these young adults could not guess from these four options, which is the correct answer. So it's not just a question of, well, do they know BCC, but do they actually understand what it is? Another example is fishing, which is very low on the scale, and you could th be thinking, well, maybe someone doesn't know the word fishing, but that doesn't mean they don't know what to do with identifying URLs, which is, of course, important because one way you get scammed is if online is if you don't know the source of the information that you're looking at. So in 2012, I asked people um, this question, and again, I'll give you a minute. And if you understand the web and you understand how, how to read web addresses, I think you don't have too hard a time answering this question. Um, but what's interesting was that among these very savvy young adults, an extreme minority uh, was able to identify the actual correct URL that one would, that would be a, a, a bank's URL. So these raise concerns and, socially, and certainly suggest that just because people are young, it doesn't mean that automatically they know everything about the web. Okay, so are certain people, so now we see that they're definitely, uh, not every young person is universally savvy, but do we see any patterns of uh, who's savvy and who isn't? So I'm going to look at gender and socioeconomic status uh, I've skipped the, the race uh, slides because I thought that might be of less interest here. But so what we see in terms of, so skill here is measured as the average of 27 internet related items that you saw. And what we see is that men are reporting higher skills than women. I'm purposefully saying are reporting, this gets complicated. Uh, interestingly, yes, so there is a little bit of uh, improvement in, not, in understanding over three years. Uh, so again, this is the same people over time, the same terms asked over time. There's some increase in both uh, groups, but the differences, in fact, remain. However, for the gender slide, I like to add this. It says, but it's complicated. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions in Q&A. I have several papers uh, that have explored the gender question in more detail because it is, in fact, quite complicated. Um, and I will add that when I originally started studying internet uses and differences, I was not actually interested in gender, but it just kept sort of screaming in my face that I had to look at it, so. Um, okay, so relationship of skill and socioeconomic status, which I measured as uh, parental education, um, shows a clear relationship. Uh, that is a statistically significant relationship of low SES, high SES, um, so again, you might say, well, but you know, people are learning all the time, probably they're probably catching up. So back to that question of, well, are they catching up? What, are, what do those slopes look like? So it's very interesting Then I show you the skill for 2012, same group. So it's, I think, a remarkable graph to show that, yes, everyone's gaining a little bit, but, but they're gaining at the exact same rate. So there's absolutely no catching up going on on behalf of those who are less privileged. And the other thing to recognize is, of course, as time goes on with the internet, new services always come up. And so you can't, it's not enough to catch up with the old services. You need to be learning about the new as well. Fortunately, um, the Federal Communication Commission, when they administered a survey nationally in 2009, they used part of my skill measure in their national survey. And so I was able to look at how these things look for a nationally representative sample. Um, and where we have variation in income and education, which um, 
income. We didn't know for my group, and education was obviously controlled, as was age. So what we found in the nationally uh, representative sample in the U.S. was that both education and income are positively related to skill. But interestingly, age 50 and below, there's no relationship between skill and age. So above 50, there's a, a pretty quick drop off, but 50 and below, there's not. So again, evidence, this time evidence that there's not necessarily generational differences in the way that people tend to assume. So let's look at people joining communities. Uh, so again, by generation, we think everyone's everywhere, and for years we've been hearing about Twitter and Twitter this, Twitter that. I don't know how popular it is here or how popular it is assumed to be here, but in the U.S. you hear a lot about how everyone's on Twitter. And in fact, 2009, many people hadn't even heard about it. Um, and in 2010, still very few were using it. And just to, I know it's kind of hard to remember what was 2010, so by 2010, many American celebrities had joined Twitter. So like Oprah Winfrey, who's very well known, was on Twitter, and lots of sports celebrities were on Twitter. So there was definitely by then public consciousness about Twitter to some extent. But still very few were using it. What's nice, again, is that we have data from 2009 that we can use to figure out, well, who actually adopted Twitter by 2010. And so what we found, like others had for nationally representative data on, the, on Americans, is that African Americans in particular were more likely to use Twitter, and there were all sorts of questions of why that might be. One was they use cell phones more, the other was they text more. But again, many of these assumptions were just sort of anecdotally based well, we had data, so we were able to test. Well, are those things, what are, is that what's explaining their adoption? And no, it turns out it doesn't. So we were able to control for texting often and having access to the web on a mobile phone, and those did not matter in terms of adopting Twitter a year later. What did matter was that if you were more skilled in 2009, you were more likely to use Twitter in 2010. And then another factor we had data on for 2009 was People's level of interest in different topics. Celebrity news, sports, politics, arts and crafts, religion, whatnot. And it turns out what really matters is that you're interested in entertainment and celebrity news. And note that as I go from this slide to this slide, the line from African American disappears, which means that in fact what was what drives blacks' higher likelihood to adopt Twitter in this group is that they're more likely to be interested in entertainment and celebrity news. That's it. And then for those who were excited about the potential of politics with respect to Twitter, so none of these things actually mattered to adopting Twitter. I should emphasize, again, this is a group of young adults. It may be that with older adults it mattered. Um, and this also doesn't look at whether once you use Twitter, does your interest in those uh, topics go up. So this just looks at what initial interest may have contributed to joining Twitter. Looking at 2012 data and socioeconomic status in terms of joining communities, what we see is for all of these social network sites, these tend to be relatively popular in the U.S., I mean relatively, right? So we still have the majority of young adults not using any of them, but these are the most popular of the ones that exist, except Facebook, which is missing from here, which does have near universal adoption in this group. Actually, not new. it's less than 90%, but it's around 90%. And what we find is that socioeconomic status for each of these social network sites is related to whether you adopt the service or not. And so, one, in addition to just generally that being interesting, from a methodological perspective, what you want to take away from that is, as, as researchers, or at least some researchers, move to using sites like this as sites of data collection as sampling frames. You need to remember that if you're getting all of your data from sites like this, you're automatically by design excluding certain populations. So depending on your research questions, you need to be careful about that. In terms of skill, what we see is that, um, oh, I don't, can you see the two, two columns hopefully? Um, what we see is that people in the lower quartile, so low skill is the lower quartile and the high skill refers to the higher quartile, highest quartile of skill. And that, again, your 2009 skill is very much related to whether three years later you're adopting these services. But we can also look at concurrent skill level. The graph almost doesn't change at all, right? Hopefully you can see the, it's a very minor difference. So basically, again, less skilled are much less likely to be adopting these services than the more skilled. 
How about when it comes to contributing content? So I have data on whether respondents uh, engage in these different types of activities. And again, despite being the young adults who are supposedly doing everything online, um, very few are doing several of these things and they're 15% uh, are doing none of this ever, right? This isn't do you do it often or how many times. So we, this is just ever, have you ever done this? Um, and here, again, we have differences by gender with men uh, reporting more. We have some uh, relationship between socioeconomic status and contributions. And what we also have is, again, what your skill is in 2009 very much relates to how much you're contributing three years later. So skill matters. I want to talk a little bit about, I think I have time, um, about this specific paper uh, focusing on Wikipedia edits that I've been working on with my colleague Aaron Shaw. Um, so Wikipedia, why should we care about who edits Wikipedia, where it's, it's, it's widely known as one of the most popular websites out there as an information source, uh, billions of monthly page views, many, 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 many hours uh, put in by people. And definitely because of how many people are turning to this as a first source of information, it does really have the potential to influence what people think about. So we should care about who's actually authoring it. Um, so what we found was this, uh, I'll mention this since this is a learning uh, environment, um, that 12% of our sample had actually been assigned to edit a Wikipedia entry or start a new entry as part of their class, which was interesting. And I'll, I'll show you some figures, uh, both with respect to the full sample and with respect to um, those people taken out. So just to make sure, again, that we're measuring things as one would expect, so pretty much everybody reported that they use Wikipedia to read entries, which is what we would expect. Um, so it seems like the data are probably quite reliable. But then what do we have when it comes to actually contributing to the content? And I purposefully asked in different ways, um, you know, is it, are you fixing a mistake? Are you adding new material? I wanted to make sure that we captured all those different aspects. And as you can see, very few, relatively really few people are doing this, especially with any level of popularity. In fact, if we put it all together, we have just over a quarter who have ever done this. And when we take out the people who've done it for class, we just have a fifth who've ever done this, which may be high or low depending on how you think about it, but again, not what you'd think the great you know, young generation who does everything online all the time, you'd expect potentially higher numbers. Again, let's look at some predictor variables. So we have men reporting much more likely to have ever re uh, edited Wikipedia. There's been a lot of conversation around this in the US, articles in the New York Times discussing this, different papers looking at this. Um, so pretty much confirms those patterns. Not much difference between the full sample and uh, excluding those who'd done it for, uh, as a school assignment. It's interesting when it comes to socioeconomic status. So excluding people who'd done it for a, a school assignment, we definitely see a statistically significant relationship between SES and contributions. But when we look at the full sample, that actually goes away. So this shows that there's some potential for educational interventions when it comes to activities like this. So if, if schools actually encourage uh, do it, engaging in such activities that can make a difference in leveling the playing field when it comes to socioeconomic status differences. Not surprisingly, having confidence in Wikipedia three years earlier uh, matters to whether you're editing. So that's, that's almost kind of obvious, but uh, still interesting to note. Uh, just to confirm, this is what the literature would refer to as self-efficacy, so your belief to be able to do something as compared to skill, which is more that can you actually do it. And then what we find is that certainly internet skills um, very much matter. So your skills from three years ago are still this much influencing what you're doing um, three years later. And when we put all this together in a regression model, um, basically all we find is that gender is what matters, so men are contributing more, skill is what matters, and of course having been assigned it as a school assignment matters. But interestingly, when Something like confidence in editing Wikipedia does not matter anymore uh, when we control for other factors. So that was an interesting finding. And then what we did then was we ran a model to predict probability of contributing at different skill levels. So this isn't necessarily when people contributed, but the probability as predicted by the model. 
And what you can see is, so the green is men and the purple is women. And what's really interesting is that if you look at, if you take low-skilled people, whether male or female, they're just not contributing. So the, the gender difference is really at the high end. Um, and really the big question we need to be asking is why is it that women who are highly skilled are so much less likely to edit Wikipedia? And unfortunately we don't know the answer to that, but this is something that I hope a lot of research will address because I think it's a really important question. So just a, a few more, a couple more slides um, on privacy and security issues since that's increasingly important area. In fact, when a decade ago I started studying skill, I wasn't really thinking about this because a decade ago these weren't such important matters. And back then my thinking was, well, who will benefit from their internet uses? And interestingly, over the past few years, this other question of, well, who's going to run into a lot of trouble because of their lack of internet skills has emerged as an issue, right? So who's going to lose their job because of what they're doing online and not realizing the potential repercussions? So in a paper with Eden Litt, we looked at, for the same uh, sample, we looked at how often people are thinking about, how often people are changing either their settings or content of what they post on social network sites because they're thinking about a potential employer audience. And this is relevant with this group because these are either seniors or people who have just graduated at this time of data collection. So they're definitely looking at trying to find a job and they should be thinking about their audience when it comes to social network sites. And what we see is over a quarter just have never thought about this at all and never like, change their behavior because of this. And again, what we see is that there's definitely a relationship between skill and this type of uh, privacy management um, in that for those in the lowest quartile skill are the least likely to have ever done it and those with the highest uh, level of skill are the most likely to have done it more than once or actually four more times. And again, we have gender differences, or, although in this case, this is the one case when it comes to privacy management where women are more likely to be more actively engaged. And the, the probable explanation for that is that, at least in the US and media, there's a lot of moral panic around, especially young girls' use of the internet and digital media and predators and all sorts of stranger danger and issues like that. And so um, we're hypothesizing that girls more than boys are socialized to be afraid when they're online, which by the way, definitely has potential repercussions for how they develop their skills. But at least in this domain, they're more likely to be thinking about who's their audience and acting accordingly with their content. So I haven't talked about, I've talked about some of this, but many of these uh, outcomes I haven't talked about today, but I have published other papers on. And basically a very consistent finding is that skill very much relates to types of uh, activities people engage in. So whether it's political content, health content, job related uh, activities. So skill matters. So why is that helpful? We also know that gender matters. We also know that socioeconomic status matters, which is important to know. But those are factors that are not that easy to change, nor are we necessarily trying to change anyone's gender. Um, so, however, skill is something that is hopefully potentially open for intervention, right? So that's an area where education, whether it's educational institutions or other institutions like libraries, can have the potential to improve people's online abilities. And so because we know that skill is such an important predictor of so many types of online engagement, it is an area where we should focus efforts. And again, even with young adults, with the supposed super savvy generation, we find these differences. So we need to keep that in mind for all generations. So the, the takeaways um, that I would like you to uh, think about um, are that there really is variation across, uh, even among young adults when it comes to their internet skills and that it's very much systematically related to people's backgrounds such as gender and socioeconomic status, usually with those who are more privileged, having higher level skills, and that this also then relates to what people are actually doing online and so suggesting that it is the more privileged who are probably benefiting more. So going back to those three possible outcomes, what we're likely seeing 
is that in fact the more privileged are gaining more ground than the less privileged and thus the differences are actually increasing among them. And so that's potential concern when it comes to questions of social inequality. Um, so you might remember in 2006, uh, Time uh, had as its person of the year you. Um, this was a time when people were very excited about uh, participatory uh, options online, but what I'd like you to take away from this talk is that in fact it's only some of you and it's really the skilled among you who should be uh, on the front of that magazine cover. Um, getting back to the question of, you know, what, what are the implications of the internet more generally societally? So we had the very positive approach, right? Everything is all smiley. And we had the kind of doom approach, everything is bad. Turns out, conveniently, a smiley and a frowny make a Venn diagram. And so what I argue is that it's somewhere in the middle and it very much depends on the context and the person. So don't try to think how some digital technology or some application will affect everybody the same way because that's, ex that's extremely unlikely. What's likely is that the context in which some service is being implemented and who's, whom it concerns is what's going to matter. So that's the other takeaway. I'd just like to thank the funders and the many students who've worked on these projects and thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. <laughs>